would love to welcome you all to the CMTA and Tactile webinar, Manifest the Factory of the Future. Uh, we really look forward to walking through the Factory of the Future with you all and walking through with our experts on the line. Um, as we get started today, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Gino DeCaro uh, from CMTA. Uh, Gino, it's floor is yours. Thank you, Caitlin, and good afternoon, folks. Really excited to be here today, and uh, thank you for joining us for um, CMTA's Manufacturing Modernization Webinar on Augmented Reality. Um, I am Gino DeCaro with CMTA, as Caitlin said, and we have CMTA's Sarah Johnson with us, and of course, all our tactile exper experts, which um, uh, for whom Sarah will introduce in just a few seconds. Uh, but, but before we get to those introductions, I just want to say that you know CMTA wants to provide California manufacturers the best available options to optimize operations and train workers so they can compete among domestic production. We know it is very, very difficult and hard to operate and invest in California based on what we hear from our members. Uh, there are high costs and most importantly, expertise and knowledge is walking out your doors every day. Um, so skilling up workers quickly and remotely is ever critical, we fully understand. This is why we worked hard and we're very excited to bring you the expertise of Tactile and their thought leadership and augmented reality practices. We certainly hope you'll get a lot and possibly some new ideas um, out of today's webinar for your operations. Now I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Sarah Johnson with CMTA to say a few things and introduce our expert speakers from Tactile. Sarah? Great, thank you, Gino. And looking forward to uh, this webinar. We have definitely uh, been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks now. Um, so some of you who are not familiar with CMTA, the California Manufacturers and Technology Association is a 100 year old trade association that advocates for and against bills and regulations on behalf of all California manufacturers. Uh, we are based in Sacramento, so we have that capital presence. We also have a Southern California presence as well so that we uh, reach all of California. Um, so that's kind of just the gist of who CMTA is. Um, but more importantly, it's about this webinar and the content. So um, it's my privilege to introduce the uh, augmented reality expert, Joe Pookie. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, not, great, uh, great being here today. And we're excited to, to talk to everyone that's out there about not only tactile and manifest, but also talk about VR and AR, generally speaking, and how we can help uh, using certain types of technologies to, you know, helping that onboarding, recruiting, retention, capturing that knowledge. So I'm going to start going through, and I'm going to go through a trying to get this slide to advance. There we go. So the agenda for today is really to focus on manpower challenges and challenges just in general and what those are and defining it. So we're gonna start the discussion talking about the definition of some of the challenges that we see. And then we're going to address some of those challenges. How can we address some of those challenges? What are some of the tools available to address those challenges? And from there, get into VR, AR. What's the difference? A lot of times when I talk to people, these are two separate tools, but they get sometimes used interchangeably, but they actually address two different potential use cases and, and also can address two different challenges that you might have within your organization. Uh, the last two things are just benefits of VR and, uh, and soft skills. So the PricewaterhouseCoopers, they did a, a soft skill survey and, uh, and they came up with some really interesting results. And I wanted to cover that. And then we're gonna get into benefits of augmented reality, which is a little bit different, but instead of getting into Slideware or going through any study at that point, we're just gonna jump right into it. We're actually gonna show you the product live and you'll be the first and you're actually gonna see it as if you're an expert who's assisting someone who is out on a factory floor or out in the field or whatever way, a remote expert that, and that's the view that you will see the demonstration through. And then we'll just end with some questions and go, and go from there. The problem we're gonna talk about to start though is what Gino had spoke about, is that wave of retirements, 29 million. 29 million people are leaving uh, the, the, the manufacturing space 
And this number is not slowing down. It's actually getting, it's actually increasing over time. And then the lack of workers to replace them, you know, huge amount of uh, workers that we're looking to, uh, you know, replace and, you know, 30 to 50% of them are, are leaving in a shorter period of time. So with those two challenges at the highest level, what, what can we do and how can we break that down to, to tackle these challenges? So I had mentioned, you know, the three things, and I'm gonna break these into small pieces. And, you know, the first one is expertise and knowledge walking out the door. Those, that's the number one challenge that we need to figure out a way to, to, to control and to capture that. Uh, onboarding techniques, the existing ways or previous ways that people have onboarded, recruiting, are either not available or they're not working at all anymore or not working to the capacity that they were working before. And then newer, younger employees just have a, a shorter average tenure. So very short tenure, you compound all those problems and it becomes somewhat of a nightmare you know, when trying to onboard, recruit, and then also upskill workers. So as I look to, to break these down, you know, knowledge and expertise walking out the door. You know, we address the baby boomers, but the one thing that we didn't talk about is how fast. So the 29 million on the previous slide actually didn't account for what took place with COVID. So COVID has actually sped that up. And, it's, and we don't even have the actual numbers that you would, you would have, you know, prior to the, or during this pandemic, because it's just, happened so fast that it's hard to capture some of that information. And then the tribal knowledge is being lost forever. It's walking out the door and there's no way, way to, to get that back. You know, once someone who's an expert leaves the organization, that expertise is gone. And so what can we do about it? And first one is a simple one. It's one that, you know, I talk about a lot within our organization is focus on what you can control. And the first two things on this list are two things we cannot control. We cannot control, you know, people getting uh, coming of age and retiring from the workforce. Certainly can't control COVID and how that accelerated this trend. And, but we, a few things we could do is capture that knowledge. Like how can we capture that knowledge so that the knowledge and the people that we have today aren't going out that door with that knowledge. So, Embrace the technology that can integrate into existing systems. Sometimes you try to boil the ocean and you try to do too much. What can we do that's simple? How can we leverage existing technologies? And then how can we integrate that with some newer technologies that are out there? And then how can we capture within that? How do we capture that knowledge before it's lost? And how do we permanently capture it so that this doesn't happen in the future? So that some, a process that's easy to capture the knowledge, update the knowledge, and continue to drive that process. So over time, we're not having you know, tribal knowledge lost. It's always being captured. It's part of the new process as we go forward. The second point, onboarding recruiting techniques unavailable or not working. It's more difficult to recruit, uh, more difficult to, to bring in new talent. One of the main reasons for that is as far as bringing on new talent is you don't have the resources anymore for training, for shadowing, preparing, for mentoring. You know, these are the types of things that, you know, bringing aboard and onboarding someone, it was very resource intensive. You put them in a training class, you pair them with someone, you put them back out in the field. These are options that are still there, but they're harder to accomplish because of that massive wave of retirements. And also with that, you, how do you keep your productivity levels up? It's very difficult if you're taking all the limited resources you have today, still trying to pair them up, taking people who are newer in the organization, taking them out of a productive setting, putting them in a classroom setting so that, again, they're not being productive. They're learning, that's great, but they're not being productive. It becomes a huge compounding problem where time to productivity and upskilling have become this massive issue. So great way to do this is recruiting in a different way. 
So what we're finding in our, in our customers is they're actually using this new process and these new tools to actually excite new employees. They're using augmented reality headsets. They're using VR headsets. They're actually taking these devices to trade shows. They're actually talking about this during their recruiting presentations on how they onboard people. What tools do they have that could excite someone? And you know, also having you know, the ability to use that same, those same tools they're using to recruit and those same processes you're using to recruit. Now that's the same thing that you're using when you actually onboard. You're using very uh, unique technology that allows you to onboard without those additional resources. You know, creating templates, you know, templatize the learning. In the, the current world of learning, what people do is you have a general curriculum, general courses, at least in the classroom setting, and but each teacher, each instructor would have their own way of teaching that and own way of going through the instructive class. Now that's great because you wanna have creativity, but each person can actually lose little bits of what's important to get through to your new, new employees that are coming aboard. So how do we create something that's a template, something that is repeatable over and over again, but also allow instructors to still use creativity use technology to do that. You know, that is what we're gonna talk about today. Last one, newer, younger employees have shorter average tenure. The reason why they have shorter average tenure, three years or less is what we're finding out there is that they're unsatisfied and because either they're one, not learning or they're not doing something new. They always want to be stimulated always wanna try new things, always wanna learn, always wanna have a different path, always wanna have the ability to bring in new uh, income for themselves. And they're also being targeted by less traditional manufacturing companies that are moving into their areas that might pay more. We have an example of a, a customer of ours by the name of PVC Linear, and their biggest challenge was, and the reason why they came to us is, they, all of their employees were recruited away, well, not all, but a, a significant amount of their employees uh, on their manufacturing floor were recruited away by Amazon because Amazon opened up a building in the neighborhood and they're able to pay more. And you know, people are gonna move to, to somewhere where they can make more money. So there's two ways you can make more money. You can learn new skills, so you can improve your value. You can get promoted within the organization you can do different things within yourself, but how do you as an organization arm those people to be able to be self-sustaining and also grow your organization at the same time? So what can we do? You could simplify the process to teach someone a new skill. I talked about putting together templates, having templates that are repeatable, that don't need to be thought about over and over again. They don't need to be reinvented over and over again. Once you come up with a template, you're implementing these templates so that you can learn a new skill or you can onboard. The same tools that you would use to onboard someone and teach somebody new is the same tool you would learn, use to upskill someone out on the factory floor. So these are different things that you can do to control that, make it easy for them to learn in an autonomous way so they can be by themselves, they can take initiative on their own to keep learning, keep acquiring new skills, keeping it fresh. And what does that do? It gives you as an employer, an, an employee who now has a ton of skills. Those skills are very important for promotion within the organization and also monetary. You can't, if somebody's not learning a new skill, you're probably not gonna give them additional money to do their job unless there's other competitive forces that are out there. But if they can continue to increase their skills, of course, you're gonna to wanna to keep that employee. Of course, you're gonna to wanna to promote that employee. And then you're also making it fresh. It's something new, it's fresh. They're learning new skills. So you can increase that average tenure that's out there. Joe, this is really great information on some of the challenges facing this industry and, and each of these organizations that, that are really impacted by this. How do you see AR and VR's role in some of the solutions you talked about? Absolutely. And I think that this is not only, I mean, we're really early on in, in on some of this technology that's out there, uh, AR more than VR, but 
the, the applications that you'll see today when we go through the actual demonstration are going to blow you, I think, blow your mind on, on the ways that this can be used out in the world. But I'm going to touch on a study on, on VR first before we get into that. But to, to level set, VR versus AR. Most of the time when people think of VR or AR, they think of VR, so virtual reality. Their kids upstairs playing a video game or maybe themselves playing a video game in a virtual reality type situation. It's, all, it's completely enclosed. It's uh, a full consuming, you know, you're fully immersed in this situation. It's not something that would be safe in any manner to be working out on a factory floor on. However, there are very specific skills that you can use these tools for. For example, uh, sports, you know, a lot of people, VR took off in the sports world because sports athletes like to take on uh, those, those mental reps. You know, they're not doing the physical reps, but they're doing the mental reps. They're thinking about what they need to do. They're thinking about their steps, if it's tracking. They're thinking about their throw. They're thinking about the plays, if you're thinking about it in you know, football or a basketball type sense. You know, there's so many different ways you can use virtual reality to take those mental reps and go through all of that in a, in a virtual setting. But there are limitations to virtual reality when it comes to, to learning. And, and that's where augmented reality comes into play. Augmented reality really is a, a is a interaction and it superimposes a, a computer generated uh, graphics or you know any kind of interface you know over the real world so you're not having those same types of even you know some some people say that virtual reality makes them dizzy those types of effects don't exist for the majority of people when it comes to augmented reality because you're looking through the world the same way you would look through like a pair of glasses like these today they're a little larger pair of glasses but Augmented reality just puts visual overlays into the real world that allows you to go accomplish tasks, work through templates that uh, are instructional by nature so somebody can learn on the fly. So two different technologies, two different use cases. The first one I'll go through is virtual reality. And this is a study I talked about earlier, PricewaterhouseCoopers did, and it taught, measured soft skills in training. And they took 12 different locations, 12 different managers, and they looked at how can they improve or how could they use virtual reality and how does it uh, relate to some of the more traditional learnings like e-learning and classroom setting earning or learning. And the skills that we're learning in this particular study were more focused on having a tough conversation with an employee or learning about diversity or learning about inclusion or learning about harassment or you know things that are a little more HR related, a little bit more uh, conversational and putting that put them through you know the, this these trainings in a virtual reality and then compared it to e-learning and compared it to and I think the the study results, you know, as I went through it, are pretty staggering on, on the, the changes. You know, there's some points here at the bottom, 4x. 275, 3.75. 3 I'll go into the details of each one of those, but great results when using virtual reality versus uh, more traditional methods. So the first one, the 4X faster. So faster was, they, would, they were able to put them through these, these same trainings and they were able to cut down the amount of time that it took to go through the training from an average of two hours down to 30 minutes. So that same training because of many different things, distractions, questions, interactions, instead of taking that, that training that was gonna take them two, hour, two hours, it was now only taking them 30 minutes uh, compared to a, a classroom type setting. So massive improvement. But the question here I had when I read this, okay, faster, faster is not always good. My, my kid, he's nine years old. He wants to do everything fast. And, you know, he takes his tests fast as well. He missed, the only time he missed questions is because he's moving too fast. He's not reading the questions. So the real question is, are we having an impact, right? So fast is good. If you can do it faster, that's great. But you want it to be as effective as well. So this is where this piece of the study came in. 
And this part really related to the difficult conversations. So difficult conversations need to be practiced. And very rarely are you in a situation where it's a comfortable environment. You can go through a difficult conversation with maybe an underachieving employee or maybe a complaint about an employee or all these different, uh, you know, really difficult conversations. How do you practice that? A lot of times we go to training, we remove people, they're not productive anymore. Now they're moving into a training environment. Maybe they're there for a week and, and they're doing role plays to try to go through that. But when you're in front of a class, it's not really a safe zone. You don't really get to practice the way that you would normally practice. And also you might not say the same things you would say and you're not getting the reaction you would get in a virtual reality. So they created this training program where it was actually an interactive interview directly and you could interact with this avatar and you would actually get emotional responses so you could pass, you know, practice some of those emotional skills that are there. So the people coming out of this were actually 275% more confident on acting on something they needed to do uh, in, in this environment after going through the, the, the training and 245% uh, percent more confident in actually having the conversation with someone. So acting, you see something, you've identified it, it's a problem, you're gonna take an action on it versus letting it go because in a virtual reality environment, you saw multiple examples of how that was a challenge and how you need, now it's easy for you to identify so you can act on it, more confident there because you understand that's a bad situation. I need to act on it. But 245% more confident after acting on it, having a, a tough conversation with that employee as well, instead of avoiding it. We all avoid tough conversations. If you can practice them, it's going to make you tackle those challenges and get in front of those challenges. Emotional. So because it's such an immersive technology and you're on your own and you're by yourself and it's, you know, it's almost like walk, watching an intense movie. We all know how we react to intense movies. If you can create content inside a virtual reality environment, put that person in that type of immersive experience, they're going to relate to the content. You know, maybe they didn't think they were discriminating against someone, but when they watched, uh, went through the training in, in this immersive environment, you know, they really realized maybe Maybe they could do better. Maybe they, there are certain things that they weren't doing right. And they were more emotionally attached to the content versus a classroom. So 3.75 times more uh, connected to that content versus a classroom. So it stuck, it stuck a lot longer and 2.3 times more connected than e-learners. So e-learning, same thing. I mean, you're going through videos, you're watching different things on your desk, but it's not immersive. It's not like that same situation you would get and there's no ability to multitask. I mean, that's the other thing. You can't multitask. And I think that's actually what the next slide is focused on. Less distracted, more focused. You know, when you're an immersive technology and you can't interact with other people, you can't access your emails, you can't, you know, have somebody interrupt you in the middle, it's going to, you're going to be able to get things done. And that goes back to that first point. So the first point that we talked about was time you know, less distractions, you're going to get through something faster. So I think this study has proved, though, that one, we can do it in less time. Two, it's going to be more effective. And also, you can, because of this, you're a lot more focused on the content itself. So I think those two, effectiveness and, and uh, the, the actual time are huge savers. And that comes to the last point. And Tactile is not a virtual reality company, but you know that's not what we do. But in this study, they found that you know there's an initial investment on headsets because you know you're buying you know this type of equipment. But over time, it actually became significantly less expensive to have these types of programs at an enterprise level. So at 375 users, VR achieved parity to a classroom setting. So you have 375 employees. If you have that, it's the same cost as a classroom setting. However, you're getting it done faster and you're getting more, more out of it. So you have that benefit. So it's going to cost the same, but you're going to get a little bit more benefit out of it. A little bit different on an e-learning. You know, you have to get up to 1,950 employees going through that to have the same. However, the impact there, you're not getting. You're in an e-learning setting, 
you're still not getting that same impact you would in a virtual reality environment. But at 3,000 users, which is a large workforce, I understand that, but significant savings. And then over time, you can see the graph below, you're getting more and more savings by making these investments. And you're not buying headsets that are one-to-one. -one. And you know, you're know you buying one or two for an office, and then people are going through these trainings one-off uh, as they need to go through them in, in more of that immersive type environment. So the next piece, and that was VR. And those are use cases there. VR is very good at those soft skills, those mental reps. How can you go through that? AR is more focused on operational skills. So operations, hands-on, deskless workers, people who are gonna be using their hands on a regular basis. How can we actually help those individuals as well? So instead of talking about this, I wanna show you it. And there's gonna be a little bit of a pause here as I go through to get the technology set up to start sharing. But first I wanted to address the job. This is how AR is looked at, at least the tactile and manifest in the product that you'll see, is getting through the job. And the job can mean a lot of different things. There's the learning aspect of how to do the job, there's actually doing the job. And on top of that, there's managing the job. I mean, all of these are important. The key here is being focused on the job and templatizing the job, and then having the tools on the back end to be able to manage those jobs and get better at managing those jobs. So if you can learn in one way that's productive, you can do and continue to learn in a productive way and also get assisted in ways while you're doing, and then also have tools to, to increase the, the knowledge on the back end and manage it better, your organization is gonna be a lot more efficient. So I'm gonna go actually, and there'll be a little bit of a, a downtime. Caitlin's gonna speak here for a little bit while Joe, there's two Joes, so there's another Joe we never introduced, but Joe's gonna be my assistant on the, on the demonstration side of things. And we're gonna get set up and I'm gonna let Caitlin take over here for a little bit. Sounds good, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think the great thing that we walked through is what is AR, what is VR, how is it used? And we're gonna really jump into like, what benefits um, can we point specific use cases to, right? So some of the three immediate benefits that we see across the board when using augmented reality in these use cases is, is one, taking some of your training time, things that took weeks to learn um, for a specific example, something that took three weeks down to three days, speeding up that technician training, um, that job training. And so when we look at specific use cases, a company we work with called PVC Linear now can get their workers up to speed on complex procedures in three days, not the usual three weeks. Then we're also gonna walk through, you know, sort of the 92% task error rate down to 0%. Error reduction is a huge part of using augmented reality, both the ability to connect to an expert while out on the field or connect to training out on the field at your fingertips ready to go. And then also just looking at the, the overall impact or time it takes to get some of these augmented reality um, training set up, you know, about two hours and 40 minutes is what it takes to, to create that sort of step-by-step -step guidance. But once it's created, it can be altered, uh, move forward, et cetera, and added to in the future, it's, it's already ready to go. So that's what Joe and Joe are gonna walk through here in just a second. And as we get them ready to go, um, I'm gonna go ahead and share another poll. If you guys are, are ready, feel free to answer that as we get ready for the um, live use case here in just a second. Also, just as a reminder, if you have any questions or you want additional information that we might've um, sped through, please feel free to put that in the Q&A as well. And apologies, Gino. Oh, wait. Gino, I'm gonna make it so that panelists can actually answer if you if you choose. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> just just for you. But it's a really interesting idea to think through all the different use cases that might be applicable here. Should just take a few more seconds to get everything ready here. Great. 
Appreciate everybody's patience. Gino and Sarah, feel free to, to, to add any sort of the benefits that you guys have seen in, in your work around this as you're looking at specific use cases for your organizations. Yeah, I appreciate that. We, I think you're pretty much got it got it covered. I mean, anecdotally, we're, we've heard the same things you're saying, uh, Caitlin, so thank you. Excellent. Going to leave the poll up for just another minute if anybody else wants to go ahead and put their answer in and then I think it looks like Joe might be almost ready. Yeah, I think at this point, we're almost ready. I'm just waiting for Joe to share his screen and Joe to share his video. Perfect, we can see it. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through, so this is manifest and what you're seeing here is you're actually looking at it from an expert's view. So Joe has called, I've called Joe, I needed help. And, you know, Joe is, is here. I'm not sure why I can't see his picture, but normally you'd be able to see his face there. And, you know, Joe would be here, he'd be here able to assist me through a challenge. You're seeing it through his view. And what I'm going to do, though, as we go through this, is I'm going to go through a work instruction. There's two work instructions I'm going to go through uh, that I built. One is fire safety. It's just an inspection protocol that I go through. And the second one is going to be just a simple, almost, uh, you know, procedure on a printer that I have here in, the, in the, uh, my office. So Joe, are you, are you there? Or are you... I am here, can you hear me? I can. Well, uh, I actually, my video is up. I'm not sure why it's not working, but typically, yes, yeah, you'd be able to see me on the box right there. I can see him, he sees me. So what you are seeing is what I see. Yeah, so you're seeing, normally I would see Joe's uh, pretty face right here. Uh, you don't have to. Sometimes with a bandwidth issue, when you're sharing, you can't see it. Uh, when you're doing streaming through Zoom, but typically you'd be able to see that. But I'm gonna walk through this work instruction and you're gonna follow along as if you're assisting me in this job. So I'm gonna start the job. And the first thing you'll see is that little arrow. So you're starting to see an arrow and the arrow is directing me where to look. So as I come over here, I'm starting to see the first step in my procedure, my inspection procedure. This inspection procedure is a fire safety procedure. And what you're seeing here is step one, carbon monoxide detector. I have to check carbon monoxide detector. And you see some indicators pointing to them. Uh, the indicator or to the uh, uh, carbon monoxide detector. You see a box that was put in there just to know that this is what I need to be looking at. Those can be there, they don't need to be there. They're all anchored to this location. So I know that this is the location that it's gonna show up on. You can connect videos. So I can watch a quick video. If there was something specific I needed to do. These are shorter videos, you're not your more traditional longer training type videos, but just something to let them know what to look at and what needs to be done at this step. And you can also see streaming information. So right now, this is just a simulation, but if there was streaming information coming off of a machinery, coming off of anything, we can actually capture that data in real time and stream it in. So right now, theoretically, if this carbon monoxide detector was streaming data, I would know that the reading is 71, yeah, as far as uh, carbon monoxide level. Once I do that, I try to move to the next step. And as I move to the next step, you know, it's not allowing me to, to move forward unless I do something. It's requiring me to put in the meter reading because it wants to be captured. So I have to leave evidence in this case. I'm gonna put in a meter note. 
I'm going to capture. We know, all of us know, 71, correct? And I just click this. And what it does, in this case, it pulls up a little keyboard, but it also could be voice recognition. So you could actually just say 71 and it would type it in there for you. Simple type tasks. So I've captured that meter and now it allows me to go to the next step. So the next step in this procedure, in this particular case, shows a few other things that we can do, a few other markers that we can interact with. And you can see the, the leader lines, you can see a circle, you can see an arrow. Everyone I think knows what we need to look at. I don't think there's any question of what we need to look at, you know, in this uh, scenario here. But there's also a note that popped up. It says check temperature. Temperature must be 70 degrees. So then I can look, at 70 degrees, it's not at 70 degrees. So this indicator, now I've changed it to 70 degrees. So I've set it at 70 degrees. So I've taken one step out of the process. The next one is check the clock, mark the flaw, uh, mark a fault if the clock is representing an incorrect time. So I'm gonna look and I'm gonna see, guess what it is, it's not the correct time. So I have to mark a fault here. So I'm gonna mark a fault. I'm also gonna leave a quick set of evidence. And in this case, there's lots of different types of evidence, all these different evidences. You can, I can take a picture, I can leave a text, I can do an audio note, I can do a video note, so I can record something and have it saved. I'm gonna do an audio note. And an audio note, I'm just speaking. So thermostat needs to be, the clock on the thermostat needs to be fixed. And I save that note. So now that's saved as a record as part of this for any kind of back end auditing purposes, as well as for somebody to come through on the back end and actually fix the problem. It's something I didn't know how to do that. Another thing you can do when you're at these steps, let's say you got stuck, you didn't know how to do this, it wasn't part, you weren't trained on it yet or for whatever reason, you can actually assign to. So I can pull up a list of other people that are in the system and I could assign this particular step or I could assign the entire job over to someone. We don't need to do that, so I'm going to cancel that. I'll put my recording, and I've saved it. Now you see another arrow it's saying, hey, you know what? Your next step is over here. So I'm starting to move. I'm coming over here. The next step in this inspection procedure is check the corner light. We want to make sure that I inspect the plug to make sure that it's uh, working properly, and also capture a fault if the bulb is out, you know, any kind of fault. So I could capture a fault also if the uh, outlet wasn't working for somebody to come and repair it on the back end. But I'm going to do a quick inspection. You know, my hands are free if I needed to use them. And you know what? This bulb here, it's not working. So I'm going to mark another fault. I'm going to leave evidence that I marked that fault. In this case, I'm going to leave a text message. I add that text. I'm going to say three. Place. Oh. Again, I don't have the voice recognition on, but you could set it up with voice recognition. So I closed that one out and now it's closed out. And I had Joe here the whole time I and mean, you're seeing it the way Joe, if there was ever any help needed, he could help me with going through that procedure in a remote assist. But the great thing about it is the record that you get. So you can see this is the fire safety protocol I went through. And somebody on the back end can actually review this. They could have reviewed it in real time as well. You see that I captured 71 as the reading. So now we have evidence that if anybody ever comes back and says we weren't doing our inspections, guess what? Yeah, we were on this date. It was 71 and we captured that on 1028. And the whole procedure took five minutes and 30 seconds. Also, the evidence on the faults, you can see these are the faults. So somebody could monitor this, they can listen to the audio note, they can look at the picture, they can look at a video, and they can know what the issue was. Okay, here's a fault. I have to clear this fault. So when they pull up a job board, they have these faults that they could assign work to, and then you could have other templates to actually complete those tasks. Check corner light, same thing, text note. I spelled wrong, but that's one of the other key benefits of what we can do on the back end is capturing that evidence 
forcing steps to make sure everyone's going through the same templates at the same time. I'm going to go through one more quick. So this is the job board. It's a little overwhelming if you're looking at it through my view, but I can sort it by my jobs. You can see I, I just replaced or I just finished this one. So here's all my completed tasks. Just completed this fire safety one. You can see it shows that there's a fault there. But also now I have my, my assigned jobs that I have to get through. Here's my next one. To pull that up. Let's get all this other stuff out of the way. Let's start the job. What does it do? And how is all that anchored, right? You scan. It's a QR code. So you scan the QR code, and that's how everything gets anchored to that location. So now everything's anchored. Everything knows where to be. And it also can pull up information about the asset itself. So scan it, pulls up a lot of information about the asset. I can also start to go through the job. Same procedure. And I'm not going to go through, hey, there you are, Joe. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I'm not going to go through this whole procedure here. Uh, just to give you an idea, though, how this could be used in a lot of different ways. In this case, it's going to be replacing an ink cartridge. Very simple procedure but this will give you a really good idea of how that would work. Assemble all parts and tools, add a picture. What parts and tools do I need? You know, obviously I need a printer and I need an ink cartridge, very important. And I can move to the next step. As I move to the next step, it says remove front panels. I know how to do this, it's a simple step. However, maybe somebody on a little bit more complex device doesn't know how to. And they don't even know what part to look at. So what you can see, I have arrows, I have leader lines, everything's pointing to that location. I could pull up a bookmark of a document, which would might be the PDF of the actual document itself or the instruction manual itself. I bookmarked it on this particular page, replace ink cartridge. So I know that I can come to this if I needed more details on how to complete this. I could look through it if my videos weren't accurate enough. I can actually scroll through the entire document. That's just another tool. And then I can watch a video. Usually the videos are the easiest. I mean, this is hands-on. You got to learn how to actually do this stuff. So it shows me exactly how to do it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to follow the instruction. I'm going to open the printer. I'm going to close that out. I'm going to go through two more steps. And I think we'll give you a much better idea of, of what, what the possibilities are. And so here you're seeing, now we have multiple choices, right? So in anything you do, any step, there might be multiple choices that you can go down. In this case, there's black ink, there's color ink, maybe there's remote assist if I hadn't already called Joe. So I could call and I can select each one of those and each one of these are different templates for that particular procedure. And it will take me to that procedure. And I don't know if you can hear this or not, because I think it's just in my headset, but it's an audio note and it says, hey, be careful when removing this cartridge. Don't press hard because we've had damage happen before with these cartridges. So you need to press gentle. So it's just an action note that popped up warning them, hey, be careful here. We don't want to break it. This will cost us money. And then quick video on how to actually execute the task itself. Now I feel super confident to complete it. Also have more indicators. I mean, you can see how accurate, you know, these indicators actually are because they're all linked to that QR code. So I know where to look, pull out the, the cartridge, move to the next step. This is the last step. Again, I have an action note that popped up. We're streaming data. So I'm streaming information on print count. 75 black and white is where we're at, 122. This is red. I set a threshold. When you set threshold, if you're over that threshold, it's going to turn red. It's going to say, hey, there's an issue here. Something's going on. Maybe this is power. Maybe this is uh, voltage. Maybe this is flow. There's a lot of different things you could do to stream in that data, but I've captured that information. But what this step is saying is, hey, you got to recycle. We have a recycling program. It's important to the company. This is what we need to do. This is the can you need to use. Here's a quick video. Oh, I'm glad.
Most people know how to use the recycle cartridge, but it's just an example. I'm gonna close that out. Now I could actually, I have the cartridge, I could put it in there. I'm not gonna, but you get the point, but I'm trying to move on. Because this is so important to us as a company, the recycling program, we're requiring them to show evidence. In this case, it's gonna be audio evidence, but you might wanna, if something's really important, you might wanna have actual video evidence. You might wanna have a picture of them actually doing what they need to do because of how important it is. It also could depend on tenure. Someone's been around for a long time, you know that they're gonna do it the right way. If they're newer to the organization, maybe you wanna make them do certain steps. So I need to leave evidence again. I need to leave an audio note. Completed recycling program. So I just record a quick audio note. Also I had to leave a meter reading. So on the back end, all this could be integrated. So if you had a billing, let's say, maybe you're working with a big copier company, they bill you for the number of color prints. You have to capture that. You could have this information. They could just capture it. You can see it's 122. Capture the information, send it. This data could be sent to some kind of accounting billing situation uh, scenario as well for a long-term record. So I'm gonna save that. And now I can move on. So it brings me back to the original. So now I completed that step, I can move on. Now I'm not gonna continue down this path. It's a, it's a lot of the same types of things. So I'm gonna close this out. And I think that's going to conclude the demonstration portion of this webinar. So I'm gonna hang up and say goodbye to Joe. So I'm gonna hang up on Joe. You want to wave at the crowd before we go, Joe, at all, or we're not? There he is. All right. Well, thanks, Joe. Sometimes I give tours around my house, but I think I'm going to skip that today. But obviously, a lot of different ways in a remote connect type scenario where you're just viewing what someone else is seeing uh, through goggles or an iPad or other devices you can do. So bye, Joe. So I think we're right at time, but if, uh, if there are any uh, questions or, or anything, I think there's some questions here at the end, please feel free to ask. Yeah, Joe, I think we have a couple of questions that came in that we can answer offline too. But one of the ones I saw was, where can we find more specific use cases around manufacturing using AR, VR, manifest, et cetera? Uh, we can send you very specific use cases, or you could go to our website, tactile.com. We have a lot of use cases there. It includes videos, um, white papers, you can also just re reach out directly to myself or to Joe Royal or, or anybody at, at Tactile. I mean, I'm primarily in charge of new customer interactions. So if you want to just set up a call with me, I'm available as well. Excellent. Hey, There's, Joe, is there, it's, I'm sorry, Caitlin. Uh, this is, you know, I just thought I'd interrupt really quickly with a question. Is there any particular part of the manufacturing industry that you guys specialize in more than others? Um, in terms of subsectors within manufacturing, like you know, aerospace, uh, ag, um, you know, all sorts of things. Is there any specific um, subsector you specialize in? I wouldn't say there's a specific uh, subset per se. I think that it, the manufacturing floor itself for training, utilizing machinery, how to use machines in the factory floor, is probably our biggest use case that, and we have the most customers doing it that way and the most success stories seeing it used that way. Uh, so that, that's gonna be the segment of the manufacturing sector that we're seeing the most, but as far as the actual vertical, not really. I mean, anybody who has a manufacturing floor that needs to learn how to use a piece of equipment, 
onboard someone, teach them how to use that equipment, then also upskill them when they're on the factory floor where you could put on the a headset, use an iPad, walk up, scan a QR code, walk through step-by-step -step on how to work that machinery without any inter interaction with someone else. That's our sweet spot. That's where we're gonna see the best and quickest uh, you know, uptick in, in this type of technology. One, one follow-up question that I promise I'll stop, Caitlin and Joe, but um, how about CNC machining? Have you seen an application for this? And I mean, that's a pretty intricate process depending on where the, the worker is and his level of, of expertise. But um, have you guys seen this used for CNC machining to train up workers? Uh, I wouldn't say, I mean, there, definitely there's a few use cases out there, but I, that's why the factory floor works quite well is the factory floor and inspections is a good place for people to cut their teeth on this kind of technology and they're gonna see immediate impact on it. In that space, it's a little bit more difficult just in general. I mean, it's a difficult, more difficult task to do. And so the offering process takes a little bit longer. So I think companies are just choosing to use it in other areas first to get used to it before they take on a little bit more complex tasks. Not that we can't do it, we just don't see as much of it today. Yeah. Understood, thank you, Joe. Perfect. And listen, I know there's a lot of info shared today. It was really great, Joe. Appreciate it. Gino, Sarah, um, and Joe Royal, thank you all for your expertise in this area. Um, there is a final poll up if you guys want to go ahead and answer that and, and we can get back to you. There's a few other areas we can respond, um, but we do appreciate everybody's time today.